All right, welcome everyone who's coming in. I'm gonna leave Jan on waiting room duty and we'll get going. So welcome to faves number 22. That's hard to believe. Um, we're here with an exciting guest, Dr. Saima Aslam. And uh, I'm gonna introduce her in a second. Um, just a reminder that the reason we're doing faves has all been born out of the pandemic for bringing together uh, phage researchers with people interested in phages, whether that's from a clinical standpoint or a biology standpoint, we really felt that um, at the conferences we were going to, there wasn't ever a lot of overlap between the clinical and the biological, but that definitely is needed in this field, especially. So I'm excited to bring you a clinician who's been treating uh, patients with phages since 2017. So uh, Dr. Saima Aslam is a professor of medicine at UC San Diego in California, and she's the director of solid organ transplant infectious diseases service as well. So she treats transplant patients as well. And she's the clinical lead at IPATH. So you've, you've probably heard of IPATH, the Center for Phage Therapeutics in, at UCSD. So we're really excited to have Saima give a talk today about what she's been learning from um, these phage therapy cases with patients. So I'm going to almost hand it over to her. I just have two more slides to show you. So coming up soon, this is a sponsor um, for our series. They've sponsored the event today, um, Phage Futures Europe. So it's coming up at the end of November. So if you want to check that out, you can register. We always like this conference and definitely all on the translational side of phage therapy. And that is going to be in person in uh, Brussels, Belgium. So hopefully everything stays stable for that. And phage fun. This is the last slide I'll, I'll share. This is coming up at the end of the month. So we recently started a, um, a, a phage fun after the Evergreen Conference in August, where we kind of had like informal breakout rooms where you could jump in and out of different rooms and some of the titles like catching up with friends, new to the phage community, lab troubleshooting. So this is just an informal session that we're gonna be hosting at the end of every month for an hour. And you'll notice that it says um, that it's on the 30th, that's if you're Australian. So if you are not, which is everyone here, I believe, um, it's actually the 29th. So check out the QR code for the correct time zone for you. So that'll be hosted by Steph Lynch, who is our faves volunteer coordinator. All right, I am done. I'm gonna stop sharing. It is over to you, Saima. And thanks so much everyone for being here. Leave your questions in the chat and we'll get to them after. Okay, well, good morning. It's morning for me, it's 9 a.m. So good afternoon and evening, I think, where everyone else is. I just wanna make sure that you can see my screen and nothing is like hidden or blocked. That looks good to me. Okay, awesome. Cool, so um, I'm a clinician. And so what I wanted to do was sort of talk about phage therapy from a clinical perspective. But it also sort of bring in, you know, a patient perspective. Um, so things that we've learned from them and then things that they potentially would like from us uh, as people developing phage therapy. So um, my conflicts of interest are noted here. And I wanted to start really just by thanking as well as acknowledging the many people that are listed here. Um, their efforts, you know, to various extents are reflected in the talk that I'll give today. Uh, along you know, with various results and things. So starting off from there. So this is one of my patients. And um, actually, you know what, before we get going, we had a poll. Jessica, do you wanna do the poll real quick? Yes. Yeah. So I wanna do this poll just to get an idea of you know, who all is listening and that helps me you know, either ignore some things or elaborate on certain things. So we'll wait a couple of minutes. So it looks like majority of people are microbiologists and there's one so far, one clinical person and one that is, or a couple that did both. Okay, I guess we can stop, that's fine. So the majority of people here are microbiologists um, and very few, uh, it looks like with clinical, uh, with a clinical background. So um, th this is one of my patients. 
And at least from an infectious disease physician perspective, um, I think all of us, me, you know, my colleagues, we've all seen, you know, at least one, generally, you know, many more than that, patients that have sort of come at the end of the road in terms of their infectious issue, uh, either because it's been refractory to antibiotics or it's, you know, incredibly drug resistant. Um, but regardless, we come to a point where we feel like we really have nothing more to offer. And over the last few years, you know, that's where phage therapy has come in. It's sort of been this option of last resort to help these people. But I think as we move forward and we learn more, hopefully phage therapy is something that is not an option of last resort, but better, you know, something that could be used earlier on and perhaps, you know, with better results. So uh, what I wanted to do Oh, oh, so what I want to do today is just give you a brief overview of our experience at IPATH in San Diego. We've treated a number of patients, but I thought I would discuss sort of two of them in some detail, and then also go over key learning points from these different cases, um, and then talk about, you know, what are the challenges in clinical phage therapy, um, and where do we go from here? So this is our referral pattern uh, for iPads. So we started treating patients at UCSD in 2016. That was when Tom Patterson was treated. Um, iPath sort of, you know, the entity was created in June, 2018. And you can see since it was set up, we've had more than a thousand requests or referrals for potential phage therapy. Uh, many of these, you know, and I and Chip were sort of the two main people that kind of go through these requests. For at least half of them, you know, phage therapy is not indicated for the problem that they submitted, you know, that referral for. There are a number of people that just don't have the kind of details that we would need. But in general, of this large number, phage hunt was recommended in almost 200 patients, 190. Um, and it, phage hunt was actually initiated in 160 of these. And you can see that lytic phages were found for 77. And eventually a subset of that are the ones that were treated. So overall, from the number of referrals to patients treated, it was about 2.5%. Um, of the patients that we've treated, certainly there are patients here um, at UCSD, and they're not actually included in this referral pattern, uh, but these are all outside UCSD. So we've been involved um, you know, through IPATH, but also before in treating patients. And you can see sort of this last little box here, even though we found phages in 77, you know, subset were treated. And partly because in some patients uh, that referral was started too late um, and they dis were deceased before phage could be administered. For some, the infection actually had resolved. Uh, so perhaps, you know, wasn't indicated initially. Um, and then we have sort of a few other reasons why patients did not undergo phage therapy. Our top three reasons for consults are Pseudomonas. So that's like the number one organism we hear about, Staph aureus, and then the third one is Mycobacterium abscesses. So, and this sort of gives you an idea of where we get requests from. The majority of them are from the US, Canada, um, you know, some from Mexico, Australia, India, South America. But in general, we've sort of heard from most places in the world um, in terms of assistance for phage therapy. So UCSD locally, we've treated 13 patients. And you can see there's sort of a variety of different kinds of infections in different organisms. So we have the MDR Acinetobacter bomini. This was the initial Tom Patterson case. We have a couple of those, and we have at least half of these are actually pseudomonas. Uh, in pneumonia, cystic fibrosis, we've got prosthetic infections. So left ventricular cyst device is a cardiac device, uh, as well as hip infections. Um, and then we have these recurrent sort of urine infections and bacteremia in the setting of either immunosuppression, such as liver or kidney transplant, or again, sort of a device infection or biofin-based infection. Um, you can see we've had you know, successes. We've also had a few failures. Um, and there are a couple of patients we were unable to interpret basically because they died before completion of phage therapy. Um, and so in general, so I think, you know, we learn from success and success is what gives us hope to keep doing this. But I think um, certainly, you know, there's room to learn from failure as well as we move forward. We have a few more patients lined up. Patient 14 just started phage last week. Um, and then there are a few that are on hold, um, number 15 and 18, mainly because it seems like they're actually responding to treatment with antibiotics. And so 
We have phage on hand if needed, but we're not starting phage at the moment. So I want to talk about two cases. This is this was my first case. Uh, this was our second case at UCSD. It was a lung transplant patient who underwent lung transplant in October, and over the next six months, basically had a very complicated hospital stay um, in which he had rejection of his lungs, which required increased immunosuppression. Uh, he had, um, you know, renal failure. He had what's called um, allograft failure as well, so chronic rejection of his lung um, and a variety of other complications. But throughout this whole time over these, you know, six, seven months, he kept on having pseudomonas aeruginosa pneumonia. And this was associated with ventilation as he was on a mechanical, uh, he required mechanical ventilation because of his chronic respiratory failure. And every few weeks we'd have pseudomonas and eventually it became more and more and more drug resistant. Um, and so we just did not see this patient leaving the hospital. Um, he also had, he had developed renal failure from antibiotics and actually was on dialysis as well. These are current episodes of sepsis were all from pseudomonas pneumonia. So by May, we had, he had another episode of pneumonia and you can see his pseudomonas originosa in general was highly drug resistant and we didn't really have good options to treat him with. So at that time we had reached out to collaborators at the Navy as well as Amplify um, and we ended up getting phage um, from both sources. And we uh, were able to get a compassion use or emergency uh, investigational approval from the FDA to treat this patient. Um, and so this is just a pseudomonas. Uh, this is with ABPA. This is a four phage cocktail that Amplify had at the time. Um, and basically shows that the phages alone as well as in combination were all active against the patient's pseudomonas isolate. So in terms of treatment, it's a little complicated. He actually had two distinct periods of treatment for two separate episodes of pneumonia. You can see the first one, we treated him with ABPA. The second one treated him with Navy phage. Because he had these two episodes of pneumonia, we ended up also, and this is something we do clinically in the setting of transplant, put him on what's called suppressive phage therapy, meaning he was not really getting antibiotics, uh, but we just left him on phage, and with that, he actually did not have any recurrences of his pseudomonas infection. And you can see sort of various antibiotics that were used uh, concomitantly with phage uh, for each episode of pneumonia. For that first treatment uh, episode that we did that was treated with ABPA, we started off with a brief period of IV alone before we added inhaled, which is IN. And then we had a period of inhaled alone without IV. And part of this really was to see if there was a difference in terms of efficacy, as well as um, how much phage we got from respiratory secretions uh, using one route versus the other. So this was our patient um, at day one when we started phage. He has, so he has what's called a tracheostomy, you can see here. Uh, this is connected to a ventilator. Um, and he had you know, just these copious, respiratory secretions that was consistent with his ventilator associated pneumonia. By two weeks at end of therapy, he had uh, what our pulmonologists call the cream bronchoscopy, meaning there was minimal inflammation and minimal uh, purulence noted on bronchoscopy, which would be a tube going through his trachea into his lungs uh, with a camera. So we can see it, but also get samples. And then, you know, the seven months that he'd been transplanted, this was actually the first time he had a clean bronchoscopy. He hadn't walked for months because he kept on being sick and was on the ventilator. He actually, his respiratory status improved. He was able to walk uh, and eventually started to talk. So talking in these patients actually requires closing that hole in the trachea, um, which you know, we can only do if they're able to stand that sort of in a, you know, from a respiratory standpoint. Um, his antibiotics were stopped. There were no adverse events. This sort of uh, shows the paraphernalia we use for the nebulization um, of his phage. We added phage solution in this chamber. Um, and basically this is a little pump or nebulizer that pushes the phage um, you know, mixed with air into his um, trachea and respiratory uh, tree. So he had periodic uh, bronchoscopy. So we have D1, which is day four. We had one at day four. Four, sorry, day one, day four, eight, you know, so forth for a month. Um, and we saved samples from all of these uh, bronchoscopies when we got respiratory specimens. 
Um, and so we looked at, once we, after actually finished treatment, we uh, thawed the, the uh, respiratory specimens and actually um, plated out the phages that we could get. And you can see that at D1 or day one, prior to getting any phage, there was no phage isolated from the patient's respiratory spe specimen. When the patient, at day four, he was getting IV treatment alone. So even with IV alone, you can see we were actually, you know, getting phage from his respiratory specimens. Towards the end, uh, these two weeks, and this week in particular, was this nebulized phage alone. And again, we were getting phage um, from his respiratory specimens. We were not able to do a really quantitative assay uh, per se, but it appeared that phage were replicating based on just the amount of phage we were able to get from one you know, small sample from the respiratory tract compared to all that's there. Uh, when we viewed it, you know, in comparison with what the patient was getting. So each dose was four into 10 to the ninth PFU. Um, and at day four, we were getting four, 10 to the seventh PFU from his respiratory sample. And this is just, you know, one CC of many CC of sample. We also noted that the patient's uh, Pseudomonas uh, isolate had a change in susceptibility pattern. You can see here. And this allowed us to use less nephrotoxic drugs to treat the patient. Uh, and this is another Pseudomonas isolate that he had. Again, a whole lot more sensitive than what we started off with. The other thing we noticed um, was the development of resistance. So this was the initial phage cocktail we treated the patient. The black is the control Pseudomonas isolate. Um, and then the initial ones that we used the patient to tr we treated the patient was these red and um, yellow ones. So initially when we treated the patient, they were active against the pseudomonas isolates. Over time, they were not active anymore, but we were able to get new phages that remained active against the patient's isolates. So things that we learned from this patient, one, you can see he actually did well. Uh, he didn't have any further episode of pneumonia and did eventually go home with his family. So um, at least for us in the US, this was the first time we had used nebulized phage and we were able to show that the phage reached the lungs, you know, in the setting of pneumonia, uh, both by the IV and nebulized root. Phage therapy hadn't been used for transplant or immunocompromised patients before. So, you know, this was a highly immunocompromised patient and we showed that it was safe. Uh, we demonstrated changes in antibiotic susceptibility patterns in the pseudomonas. Uh, we noted development of resistance, but also that we were able to overcome this resistance with new phage. Um, and this is the only case I know of in which we've used phage kind of alone for suppressive therapy. And, and I think it really kind of helped the patient because without having recurrent episodes of pneumonia, it actually gave him time to recover uh, and you know able to get out of the hospital. So I want to talk about my second case, which is a MSSA or methicillin sensitive staph aureus LVAD infection. So LVAD is a left ventricular cyst device. This is a cardiac device that's implanted in patients when they have severe heart failure. So this is a heart in the setting of severe heart failure. This pump is actually implanted in the uh, preperitoneal abdominal pocket. And you can see it has a large catheter that goes into the left ventricle, it sucks blood and pushes it into the aorta. In general, these are hard to replace, mainly because this piece that goes into the heart can't easily be taken out because it's stitched in. So when people get infected and we talk about exchanging an LVAD, the, this piece remains as does that. It's just this piece that's changed. So in general, it's, it's hard really, you know, to really resolve these infections uh, when they occur. And generally what it requires is a heart transplant, which this you know, entire material is taken out and a new heart is implanted. So this patient uh, um, was a 65-year-old male who had this cardiac device implanted in 2014. A year later, he'd actually developed a staph aureus driveline infection. So driveline is this, I, this, actually it's here, this line that comes out. This basically is an electrical wire. Um, and you can see it comes out from the pump here. It actually courses through the abdominal wall. There's a little exit site in the abdominal wall where it comes out and it's plugged into a battery. Um, and you know, can actually be plugged into a wall socket as well so that it's charged. So by the time I saw the patient, it was three years later. So he'd had this infection for three years. He'd had multiple surgeries in which they tried to clean it out, multiple hospitalizations, multiple episodes of bacteremia, a lot of IV antibiotics. 
Um, and he, because he was so sick, he actually was turned down for heart transplant at five different centers before he came to UCSD. When I saw him in clinic for the first time, you know, normally you don't have a hole in your chest, but in this case, because of his infections and surgeries, he did, and you can actually see his device. Um, and all this white stuff is basically purulence. So we used in him this combination of staph aureus phages, uh, which previously had been uh, shown in vitro as well as in vivo to have antibiofilm effect. Um, so this is, and this, this is actually an in vivo study in sheep sinuses showing, uh, actually, sorry, this is an in vitro study, but there's a sheep study that shows similar outcomes. So basically showing a dose dependent effect of reduction in biofilm of staph aureus when uh, phages were used. And this specific phage combination is shown here. Uh, and this is a combination of phages called ABSA01 that also was by Amplify. So we treated this patient. So his isolate was susceptible to this combination of phages. We treated him with intravenous therapy uh, twice a day for four weeks and also continued his IV as well as oral antibiotics with, uh, during this time. And uh, we treated him completely as an outpatient because he had just been discharged. Um, so this was sort of one of the earlier ones that I treated you know, as an IV as outpatient and patient self-administered this. And our measure of success for him was a reduction of bacterial burden as well as tissue healing. Uh, and also we wanted to see safety and ideally get him to transplant. So one, he tolerated it well, there were no adverse events. Uh, towards the end of therapy, there's less white stuff, which is pus, more red stuff, which is healthy granulation tissue. Every week we did a sternal swab and cultured it. So that opening that you saw. So minus three weeks and minus two days is prior to starting phage. And this minus kind of went back, you know, three years. So every time he'd been cultured, he would grow staph aureus. Um, week one was one week after starting phage. That swab was negative, same at week two. At week three, we got staph aureus again as well as staph epidermitis. We weren't sure if this is a contaminant because staph epidermitis is generally on the skin as well. The staph remains susceptible to phage. End of therapy, EOT was week four, and again, that was negative. One week later, he went for a heart transplant. And our surgeon actually did multiple cultures. So not just the swab we were doing, but multiple cultures um, you know, during surgery. And all of these were actually negative except for two spots, this area called the info cannula and the graft pocket. So both of these areas were the ones that actually had been exposed uh, to the exterior as I showed you in the picture. So in retrospect, what I learned from this case that I've sort of done throughout and told other people is if we can apply it locally, we should have also done that. Um, and I think if we had done that, probably this would have all been negative. Anyway, he did well. Um, you know, now many years later, he, he's doing great. So um, what we saw in this case, you know, we got those um, several episodes, uh, not episodes, several um, isolates of staph aureus. Even the ones that we got from his surgery, none of them had evidence of in vitro phage resistance. In this patient, we also had weekly serum samples every time he came in to see us. And in all these serum samples, we were able to detect all three phages uh, via PCR. Uh, we also had samples of the saliva, stool, and skin, and were unable to detect phage in any of these other samples. We also assessed for serum neutralization. So you can say, see pre-treatment and towards the end of treatment, he did develop some degree of serum neutralization. In general, when you have a K value less than 10, it's considered to be insignificant. Um, and so, you know, he had some antibody development, but it did not seem to be significant. Um, and regardless, you know, he responded well to treatment. The other thing we did uh, with him, and this work uh, was done by Andre Mew, uh, who was at UC, not UCSD, but at um, during IPATH at that time. And so we looked at, uh, we did some microbiome sampling. Um, so one of the things, we did when we've had these saliva samples, skin samples, and stool samples, uh, was not only looking for staff uh, phage PCR, but also looking at metabolome and microbiome sampling. So the red is while he was on treatment, the blue is both pre and post treatment. And in general, we noted that there was a significant reduction in the ratio of staphylococcus to carinibacterium in skin samples while on phage, meaning you know the phage was getting rid of staph everywhere.
Um, he also looked at um, gut and saliva microbiomes and showed very low level variants from both the pre uh, as well as uh, during and post um, samples, suggesting minimal collateral damage um, to the gut microbiome in particular. Uh, and this, you know, again, was somebody that had already been on antibiotics for years and adding on phage basically did not adversely impact, um, you know, this patient's microbiome. So, oops, okay. So I have another patient. This was a cystic fibrosis patient. Um, my main take home message here was that we can use phage to avoid antibiotic toxicity as well. So sort of one other positive. So this was a young 20-something-year-old uh, uh, female who had a very drug-resistant pseudomonas, so you can see here. She had severe end-stage cystic fibrosis, and she was admitted in respiratory failure, uh, requiring a high amount of oxygen, and was very sick. So we and so while she was in the hospital, the only drug we could treat her with was colistin. And colistin is a highly nephrotoxic drug, and so while she was on colistin, she actually developed renal failure. Um, and generally, renal failure is one of, in many places, a contraindication to undergoing lung transplant. And so, you know, that truly for her would have been life saving. Um, in her case, while she was in the hospital on colistin, we were able to work with Amplify again, and we used that same ABPA I showed you earlier. Um, we treated this patient with IV phage therapy. Um, and when we treated her with phage, we actually stopped the colistin. She did get other antibiotics such as Cipro and Meropenem, but she actually resolved her infection. Uh, she actually had no further recurrence of infection either for at least three months after fall, after the end of phage therapy. And because we had stopped the colistin, her kidneys actually recovered and she was able to, you know, that was resolved and she underwent a successful lung transplant several months later. So just, you know, another, I think, sort of plus point of using phage uh, in this patient, at least. So this is a different patient, also a transplant patient. Um, this was a patient that had recurrent ESBL E. coli UTI and had had these recurrent UTIs actually for almost a year and had several episodes of prostatitis with it. So it was a complicated UTI in a liver transplant recipient. And he was on IV antibiotics for most of a year. Every time we stopped, within one to three weeks max, he would have symptoms again and would require further treatment. So we worked uh, with Taylor Labs uh, in Houston, um, and they were able to isolate and develop a cocktail of four phages that you can see here. Um, and the patient received therapy with these four phages along with IV erdipenem. Um, and so he tolerated it well. There was no adverse event related to the phage. While he was on treatment, his urine cultures remained negative. Um, but about eight weeks after treatment, he actually did have another positive uh, urine culture that grew ESBL E. coli. However, when he had this positive culture, he did not have any symptoms. So generally, if you don't have symptoms with a positive urine culture, we don't treat. It's called asymptomatic bacteria. So this patient um, you know, had positive urine culture but did not require treatment, uh, even though previously he'd required multiple episodes of treatment because it always been symptomatic. So Austin um, and others uh, at Baylor then underwent, uh, not underwent, they did uh, genetic sequencing, both of that pre-phage E. coli that we had and the post-phage E. coli that we had. And they noted that there were multiple uh, changes between the two isolates, um, potentially leading to a change in the sort of some, the clinical impact of these two isolates, perhaps related to changes in attachment, motility, and secretion uh, system elements. The other thing I think phage can be used for is phage antibiotic synergy. And I think that too can be harnessed for clinical success. This was from the original Tom Patterson case that was treated by Tripp Schooley. Um, and in this case, in this particular case, uh, the black is the patient's acinetobacter bomini only. He had been getting a phage uh, and actually had developed resistance. So that's that yellow. Um, the acinetobacter was resistant to, um, to antibiotics, which you can see in the red. But when the antibiotic and phage were combined together, despite you know, no great benefit 
to each alone, you can see that they were actually synergistic. So, um, so you know, that led to successful outcome. So in general, I mean, I think that synergy really is specific to the bacterial host, the phage, as well as the antibiotic combination. So I think it's worth, and most people now, I think as we move forward, we check for synergy uh, and potential antagonism uh, prior to starting treatment with phage um, and antibiotic for a patient. So actually this I talked about, this was that original lung transplant case patient. The other thing I wanna talk about um, is immune response. So for most of my patients, actually all of them, we've collected serum samples, pre-trans, not pre-transplant, pre-phage therapy, as well as weekly while they're on phage therapy and afterwards. And these are results from three different cases. So the first one I showed you already, this was the, L the LVAD patient who received uh, ABSA01 from M for MSSA infection. And you can see that he developed serum neutralization, but it was minimal. And he had a successful outcome. Um, and so, you know, we don't think that low level of neutralization impacted the outcome. The UTI patient I just mentioned to you, that patient, we also got serial samples of serum. And in that case, by week two, we noted there was actually complete serum neutralization um, by antibody development. And he actually only received two weeks of phage, uh, but you can see that we were able to induce an antibody response um, leading to serum neutralization. In this case, clinically, I think of it as a success because the patient did not have any further symptomatic UTIs and did not require antibiotics. Um, so I'm not sure you know, how relevant that was to outcome. Another case that I haven't discussed is actually a lady who had a prosthetic joint infection with staph aureus. Um, she had two separate cases or two separate courses of phage therapy. The first one was only for two weeks and she um, had a recurrence of her staph aureus infection after we stopped the two weeks. Several months later, we treated her with a new phage, a new single phage for six weeks. And in this case, we actually resolved um, and cured her infection. In this patient, before starting that second therapy, uh, that course of phage, we actually got pre-treatment samples and then weekly throughout. And in this case, actually even pre-treatment, which is the orange bar, you know, if you neutralize and waited, if you, you know, added the phage and serum, there actually was complete serum neutralization as well. So this patient, despite having complete serum, serum neutralization at the start of her phage therapy, still had a successful outcome. So I think, and you know, there have been others described in the literature, one recently by Dr. Hatfield's group in which a patient failed phage, and that was, seemed to be coincident with development of an antibody response. So I think I think we don't know enough about this. I think it's something we need to study for each patient as we move forward, um, you know, not just in compassionate use, but also in the setting of clinical trials. And it may be that the impact of serum neutralization or the antibody response, you know, to clinical outcome probably depends on multiple factors, um, you know, the kind of organism, the type of infection we're treating, and perhaps also how we're administering uh, phage therapy to that patient. Oops, let me, sorry. Okay. I wanted to briefly mention clinical trials. I don't plan to go into it in detail. I wanted to mention them mainly because, you know, we had some three recent ones that didn't work. Um, and I think it's important to see why they didn't as we treat patients uh, moving forward. So the first one was this Fagoburn trial uh, that was published a couple of years ago. Um, and this trial looked at the use of topical phage therapy that was administered to pseudomonas infected burn wounds. Um, and in this case, the control arm consisted of just sort of standard of care, which is uh, what's called silver sulfadiazine that's applied topically. Um, and in this case, the standard of care was actually better than giving phage to patients that had pseudomonas infected burn wounds. The second study is just a pilot study, so safety and tolerability of phage therapy. This looked at ABSA01 for patients that had chronic rhinosinusitis, and this had nine patients. In general, again, there's no adverse event, people tolerated it fine, but even at the end of therapy, five of nine patients still had symptoms and they actually needed antibiotic therapy. 
And only two of nine had microbiological eradication of staph aureus, even though in vitro, these were lytic phages that should have killed off the staph aureus. And then most recently is a study that looked at the use of intravesical, uh, meaning uh, into the bladder. So intravesical bacteriophages for treating uh, UTIs in patients that had a trans a surgery, uh, a transurethral resection of their prostate. So these patients, after their surgery, had an indwelling catheter, um, and that catheter was used to instill bacteriophages directly into the bladder. Um, and in this study also, actually, you know, the, so this sort of is, you know, unadjusted and adjusted. Um, their main outcome was treatment success rate, meaning that we, you know, um, resolve the infection. And in this case, you know, the phages didn't really work. Antibiotics, uh, you know, basically showed a trend towards a success rate. So an increased odds ratio of 2.5. They also looked at reduction just colony counts of bacteria in the urine. And again, the bacteriophages didn't do much. Antibiotics were better. Uh, adverse events were similar in all groups. So the question is, you know, I showed you these two cases and I'm sure you've heard of many other cases that are just wonderful um, and really make us want to use it. But when we sort of move forward in clinical trials, at least in the ones that have been published recently, we haven't really seen great outcomes. Um, and I think there's several reasons for that. So for the phagoburn study, the issue seemed to be actual phage titer. And so by the time, so in, for this study, the phages were manufactured earlier on. Um, and by the time the phage was actually used to treat patients, that titer had decreased by three logs. And so patients basically had 10 to 100 PFU per mil rather than you know, the goal of at least 10 to the six or seven um, for treatment. In the UTI study, the patients that had Foley catheters also had what's called bladder irrigation, meaning um, you know, we would give them the phage and kind of clamp the catheter so the phage stays within the bladder for 30 minutes or so. But once you open it up and let it go and then actually irrigate the bladder with saline, it probably diluted the intravesical phage that was instilled there. In the phago burn study, so again, you know, it becomes an issue of low concentration. So we're not getting the right concentration of phage to the site of infection. The other thing, and this came from the phago burn study, was that for patients that were successful, um, it was associated with baseline pseudomonas susceptibility. So as part of that initial trial entry criteria, they did not look at individual patients individual patient pseudomonas isolates and its susceptibility to the phage that was used. But in retrospect, when they went back, patients, and you know, this makes sense microbiologically, if patients had pseudomonas that was susceptible to phage, they were more likely to actually have a successful outcome. I think how we administer to patients was also important. Um, and so again, in that phagoburn study, um, the standard of care was a cream that was placed topically but the phage was administered by this alginate dressing that probably also the phage adhered to. So even though we had you know, little phage going in, a lot of it probably also adhered to that dressing. So it's unclear how much actually made it to the pseudomonas. Um, and similarly, the intravesical route, um, it's difficult to see you know, how much phage actually is retained within the bladder. Um, so other things, and this I think may be worthwhile to either discuss in our discussion section or different talks, just how to figure out, you know, how do we design a trial in which we can show benefit? Um, and I think, you know, there's some, some failures probably are very specific to the bacteria that we're trying to treat, such as Pseudomonas and that phage bacteria interaction, but then also the host factors or the human factors. So Unlike antibiotics, which generally is this two-way interaction between bacteria and antibiotics, with phage, we have that bacteria phage as well as the host immune response. Um, and probably all of these play a different role, you know, to different extents in different patients. Um, so I think, at least clinically, things that we need to develop on the in vitro side so we can overcome clinical challenges would be stability of the, of the IP or the phage product, meaning how long will it be stable? You know, what's the best temperature to keep it at? How do we package it? How do we make it easy 
to, for patients to administer. So currently most of the phages we get, you know, well, initially we used to just get, you know, one tube with concentrated phage. And then our research pharmacists would have to sterilize or sort of compound it so that it is, um, you know, fe uh, feasible for patient administration. Um, and there are multiple steps of, you know, from where it's made to where it's transported. And so you have sort of that cold chain uh, use. Uh, you know, some groups recommend keeping the phage at minus 80 degrees until 30 minutes prior to use. And I think for some, you know, people can't do that at home. So that would be an inpatient uh, administration. Um, there's certainly a lot of manufacturing work that I think is going in, you know, is in process. Developing potency, GMP, meaning good manufacturing practices, or what is you know clinically um, appropriate for patient use, and something that we can just stock at a hospital pharmacy, so that if I have a patient like an antibiotic, I order it and we can use it. There's also a lot of delay from when we identify a patient to figuring out what phage to use for it actually to get to the patient. I showed you know, one, patient, one example of resistance. Um, we talked about potential synergy, but I think this is where a lot of companies as well as you know, different academic groups are working on phage engineering to kind of overcome uh, this issue. I talked about immune response already. My other question really, and I don't know the right answer, is you know, potentially for maybe non-critical infections, I wonder if it's helpful to use phage alone without antibiotics so that there's more phage substrate and perhaps it will work better. The other thing to keep in mind in patients is that generally they don't just have one bacteria. Um, and even, you know, cystic fibrosis is an example. Um, they usually are multiple, you know, bacteria or multiple isolates just of uh, pseudomonas, for example. So because phage are so specific, we have to kind of think of downstream effects. If we're getting rid of one pathogen, is it going to let other potentially more pathogenic organisms to grow and make the patient sicker? So I think from a clinical standpoint, that's something we need to think about also. So currently in the United States, and this was just our experience, this is kind of you know, the flow chart of how uh, compassionate use phage therapy works. So, you know, we identify a patient, you want to save the bacterial isolates and send them to different groups who will then assess their phage activity against the patient's bacteria. Um, then there's generally a delay in terms of developing it in enough quantities so we can treat a patient, but then also going through these various steps that make it acceptable for patient use in terms of sterility and endotoxin product, and then submitting to the FDA Generally, they have 30 days uh, to get back to you um, in terms of do we accept or do we want changes. If someone is critically ill, that can be reduced to 24 hours. Uh, there's a variety of different regulatory paperwork, and eventually we're able to give it to a patient. So this can take from weeks to months to up to a year. Um, and I think that's sort of what I showed earlier. You know, some patients had passed away by the time we we're ready to use, or perhaps the infection had resolved already. So we have a pretty well-developed plan of how we assess for patient safety. Uh, so most of my patients I actually now treat as an outpatient. We have a dedicated clinic space for them. Um, and usually the first dose is administered in clinic. We follow their vital signs closely for at least three hours following that first dose. Uh, we have an anaphylaxis kit at bedside, which has a variety of drugs, such as steroids, epinephrine, et cetera so that if there is a problem, a reaction, we're able to use it, um, you know, rescue the patient. Um, and our clinic is very close to an emergency room in case they needed to go there. So that, that hasn't happened. Uh, we also get a baseline as well as weekly lab monitoring for patients. We look at liver tests, kidney tests, blood counts, as well as inflammatory markers. The patient gets a daily symptom diary. And this is, let's see, an example of one. So they'll tell, oops, sorry. They'll tell us what time, they'll, they'll write down what time they take their dose and look at symptoms uh, as well as vital signs at home. We usually have weekly clinic visits. In the era of COVID, some of these clinic visits have now become virtual visits, but we still have the patient come in physically for their lab monitoring as well as to get their next week's supply. We have a detailed teaching of the patient as well that we do with them with that first uh, dose that we give to them in clinic. 
So in terms of our local experience, uh, 12 patients so far have received IV phage therapy uh, and they you know, received 14 courses since two patients got two courses. And of these 14 courses of phage, one patient had a serious adverse event and none of the others. We had two patients that had nebulized phage and none of them had an adverse event. For all these patients, we haven't seen any change in kidney function or liver function or blood counts. Um, and so I wanna talk a little about that serious adverse event I mentioned. This was uh, a patient that received, uh, he had an elevated infection with Pseudomonas and developed shortness of breath, wheezing, fever, chills within two hours of getting a new phage formulation. And he was actually admitted for bacteremia. So he was in the hospital when this happened. Uh, he actually got two doses of phage over 12 hours apart and had same symptoms each time. Uh, and so we stopped the phage, treated him, he, you know, his symptoms resolved. Um, and then the phage that we had used this was the first time we had used a 10 to the 11th PFU per mil. And we actually used that same phage where we did a dose escalation study where we um, escalated the dose by one log with each successive dose. And then patient tolerated it well, um, and we continued treatment at 10 to the 10th PFU per mil. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out, and this again, you know, there are not many clinicians in the room, but I think it's important you know, on the microbiology side to be aware of this as well. I've had two patients, both of them had Pseudomonas LVAD infections. Generally, or actually always, these are biofilm-based infections. They're vascular infections because the device you know, has a vascular component. Um, and these infections generally are long lasting. So both of them have had it for months or years. So when I started phage on these two patients, I had blood cultures at baseline. So you know, time zero, which were negative. And within a week, both had actually developed bacteremia. One patient developed at three days, one developed about a week later. Um, and these, this is Pseudomonas bacteremia. Uh, these Pseudomonas strains remain susceptible to phage, but they had different antibiotic susceptibility patterns than what I had started off with at baseline. And so when I changed antibiotics, we were able to resolve the bacteremia. Uh, and one of these patients actually became really sick and ended up in the ICU in septic shock. Uh, so I think it's something to keep in mind. Uh, again, you know, we want to take care of the patient first. Um, you know, ideally they don't get sicker before they get better. Um, but in this case, you can see the red bar or red arrow are positive blood cultures that a patient developed. Blue was negative blood cultures. And these resolved eventually once we changed antibiotics. So briefly going over, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just looking at my time. So briefly going over FDA requirements. In general, the FDA, you know, wants evidence of clinical need. So it is clinically indicated. We want to show the phage kills the bacteria we want to treat. They want these to be genetically characterized. In particular, wanting to make sure there are no plasmids for resistance mechanisms. They want to see lack of lysogeny. So these are lytic only phages sterility of the final product, and we want minimal endotoxin that we're giving to the patient. Um, so some of this I tried already, and maybe it's not that important, I think, because there's not that many clinicians in the room, but in general, uh, I think it's important to try to get the right patient, especially for these compassionate use therapy cases. You know, are they stable enough that they have enough time, you know, months that would take for us to get phage to them? Um, have they already failed antibiotics? And you know how? what is the patient's perspective? What do they wanna get out of phage therapy? Um, when we're talking about treating patients, personally, I've treated both with single phage with success and multiple, I think there are pros and cons for both. Uh, again, similarly, I think we have people that prefer natural phages versus genetically modified. I, I think again, you know, all of them work or can work. Generally, we want a high titer prep I think it's important looking at pharmacokinetics as we move forward. And ideally we've looked at the presence of synergy or antagonism with antibiotics when we treat patients. This I showed you already, so I will skip. And I'm gonna let this go too again, just cause we don't have many clinicians in the group. But I think one thing I do wanna point out, but, and this I think is important from the basic science point of view also, you know, the patient again is more complicated than when we look at our 96 well plates. So we wanna look at safety or that's, you know, step number one. 
ideally we're able to give them something that's practical for use so that they could do it for themselves at home. And then definition of success, I think is important. For some patients, you know, it seems obvious it's a cure of infection. For others, it may be an improvement in lung function, or it may be that they are out of the hospital longer than they used to be, or they you know, now have an organism we can treat with oral Cipro versus IV antibiotics. So there are different gradations, I think, of what is an, a success or a good outcome. Um, so some of this I talked, I will skip. Um, so just briefly, one of the projects I'm working on right now is developing a Burkle Darius Hepatia Complex Registry and Library. This is through funding by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Our goal is to actually develop a multi-center international registry of CF and lung transplant patients that have Burkle Darius infections. In general, they're rare, uh, but they're highly drug resistant. And when patients have them, generally either, you know, they die after their lung transplant because they're not able to treat it, or they get refused lung transplant because it's so hard to treat. So, so far we've enrolled 18 patients. Our goal is to use these patients' clinical isolates and develop an extensive phage library. And Dr. Ronan Hazan uh, at Hadassah in Jerusalem is working on that piece. And uh, his, so, his lab so far has developed or found 35 phages. And then we kind of want to complete the loop and you know, go back and treat these patients in a pilot clinical trial. So this is a slide from Jean-Paul Pierney. Uh, maybe you guys have seen it before. Um, you know, I showed you these cases of people that are dying and we get phage and it's, it's wonderful and you know, they get better. But then I think we still have so much more to do in terms of you know, really developing proofs that can become more of a standard of care treatment option rather than a last resort option that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So I will stop here and I'm happy to answer questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know, Jessica, do you wanna read them out or how do you wanna do this? Yep, sure, I'll do that. Um, thank you so much for your talk. That was so interesting. Um, okay, so Hanny Anani says, wonderful talk, thank you. I'd like to ask about the persistence and propagation of phages after the treatment and negative culture results. Have you checked the host range of the used phages to know the new hosts? Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure if which one you, which patient you meant this to be, but yeah, so when we're treating patients, we usually do periodic cultures so we can get new, you know, if they have new bacterial isolates, then we save them and we do over time check their susceptibility to the phage. And so that's how we would pick up either a resistant isolate, um, which we found in a few cases and we're able to get new phage. Um, or in the case of that E. coli UTI patient, we save the sample, uh, the phage remains susceptible, but we found a difference in the bacterial host itself that perhaps impacted the clinical outcome of that patient. Mm -hmm. From Joseph, nice work. What was the phages PFU level in the blood for the respiratory P. aeruginosa patient during the treatment and at the time of recovery? That's the first question. I don't have uh, the PFU in the blood for that patient. I have it just for the respiratory, the, the BAL samples that I showed you. And that was you know, 10, up to 10 to the seventh. And um, I think you got into this phage neutralization activity um, for most of those patients, which he's asking about as well. Did you notice any major neutralization activity for that patient? Oh, you mean the pseudomonas one? So that patient, um, I didn't show the pseudomonas lung transplant patient serum neutralization results partly because that patient was actually getting monthly IVIG, which is IV immunoglobulin infusions because he was hypogammaglobinemic. He also was getting what's called phototherapy, which actually kills off T cells. <laughs> so he had a lot of immunosuppressive things going on other than just baseline immunosuppression. So we actually did look at it, but I don't think we can really sort of have any take home message from it just because there were so many other confounders. So I, I didn't show you that. Got it. Arcana says, wonderful talk. How many, uh, what dosage was required to prevent recurring bacterial infection and the duration it had to be administered? 
Oh yeah, so this is for that lung transplant patient who then had suppressive therapy without antibiotics. So um, in terms of how long it should be done, I mean, I, I don't know the right answer because it's not been tested. I mean, I only had one patient in which we did that and he was on that for a couple of months. Uh, we kept him on it as long as um, he, you know, was continuing to do better. Uh, so there was no sort of truly a scientific answer that I could give you there. Uh, the dose that he had, he was getting IV only, and this was phage we received from the Naval Medical Center. It had a low PFU titer, so I think it was like 10 to the fourth or fifth PFU per mil. So we actually gave it to him intravenously every four to six hours. Again, because this is one of the really early cases of phage, while we're still trying to figure out what is a good dose, you know, what is a good administration uh, interval. So, um, but that, that is what we did. Awesome. And she also asks if you found that post-antibiotic treatment or pre-antibiotic treatment before or after the phage, have you found one is better to eradicate the infection? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone has. I think part of the issue is, um, you know, what are we treating? So usually, you know, these kinds of infections are somewhat unique. So are we treating a UTI, a pneumonia, you know, CF? So I don't know currently, I'm not sure if anyone does, is it better to treat them first with antibiotics than phage or the other way around? Um, there've been, a, I think at least one publication of a patient that had recurrent UTI from a carbapenem resistant gram negative rod. I think it was Klebsiella um, from Europe and I forget the exact location where, but that patient received phage um, at some point alone and they were able to just eradicate the colonization. Uh, the patient that I started treating last week, I'm also treating with phage alone at this time because she does not have symptoms of an active UTI. And so I don't think you know, concomitant antibiotic is needed. So part of, if you're gonna give antibiotic or not, depends on if they're having symptoms or not. The standard of care would be to treat them with antibiotics. So I think unless we had, you know, an IRB approved prospect of clinical trial, at least for compassionate use, we cannot withhold antibiotics if that's what's clinically indicated. Uh, Mikhail Skernik asks, do you see a possibility to use phages for acute infections? Yes, so most of what I showed you were acute. So I, actually, I don't know what you mean by acute and what I'm saying. So to me, an acute infection is something meaning they're actively sick from it. So most of the patients that I showed you were actively sick, um, but we can also have chronic infections, meaning they're still actively sick from it, but it's been going on for you know more than a few weeks. So we've treated both. I think you know people have, and you know um, the Australian group has published data looking at staph aureus bacteremia, uh, which would be an acute infection, meaning you're only sick for a few days and you're in the hospital with a bloodstream infection. So I think if you have a pre-existing phage on hand, uh, like they did, um, you can use it. But most of these cases actually do respond to antibiotics. Um, so you know there are a couple of trials right now trying to look at the use of phage for staph aureus bacteremia. Again, you know, most antibiotics work fine for that initial bacteremic episode. It's usually to try to really resolve the infection, the setting of endocarditis or biofilm, that we're looking for that additional, you know, phage-related factor or phage effort. So I'm giving you a convoluted answer. I think it depends on which infection it is. So the answer would be yes. Great. Um, Tesfe asks, um, how was consent obtained for the weak patients to administer phages? Any protocol followed? I'm not sure what you mean by weak, um, as in they were really sick. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, I mean, all of these patients consented too. Uh, we have a clear, so we have an IRB protocol at UCSD in which we have a standard consent template. Um, that we go over with patients. Um, we do have an allowance that if a patient is critically ill and unable to consent, that we're able to consent their family members. 
Um, and so that really depends on your local IRB, how you would do it. But for us, yes, we have a pretty a standard template. Okay, we'll see if we can squeeze in these last couple of questions. Um, in terms of superiority requirements for phages versus antibiotics, how could phages be shown as a safer option before trying the nephrotoxic antibiotics? I think we'd have to do clinical trials, you know, prospective, appropriately controlled trials in which we can assess the effect of phage versus antibiotic. And so I feel like that's like, you know, five to 10 years down the road, probably. Um, but I mean, we're not able to do that now. I think on a case by case basis, you can make that argument uh, to the FDA to use it, um, to use phage, I mean, but to be able to do that more routinely uh, would require, you know, clinical trials showing that it's equivalent. I don't think we can show it's superior, uh, probably, but I think even if it's equivalent, that gives you enough reason to use it without antibiotics. And how we would do that really depends again on the infection we're trying to treat because the controls would be different. You know, your outcomes would be different depending on the kind of infection we're treating. Got it. Do you have a couple more minutes for these last two questions or do you have to? Sure, yeah, I I'm good. Okay, Joseph asks, how did you ensure that high phage PFU count was maintained during treatment since lots of phage particles are lost during phage preparation just before application? So, um, and I'll just give you an example of the patient which we started treatment last week. Um, so we know how much phage we started off with. We've already done stability studies uh, or our collaborators have done stability studies keeping you know, the phage in normal saline, which is what we usually use to treat patients at four degrees, which would be a refrigerated temperature um, you know, versus lower and room temperature. And you can see the difference up to a two week period of how much degradation you see. And usually there's a one to two log drop by two weeks, especially at room temperature. Um, and for some, even at the refrigerated temperature, you'll see some loss. But I think if we're starting off high, you know, we're still confident we have a good dose going in. Also, uh, when we start treating the patient, um, we also keep those samples and actually plate it out to see what, you know, what we actually, are we treating the patient with the dose that we think we are? So for, again, for last week's patient that, that's pending. Awesome. Okay, last question from Jan. Are EIND <clears throat> application approvals for phage therapy getting more flexible? Um, for example, that patients don't have to be as acute? I don't think they're more flexible. I think the FDA understands we have a variety of different indications that you know, may respond to phage therapy or are appropriate for it. But um, personally, I think they are, there's more stringency to make sure it's, it's safety. Um, so there's a lot more requirements in terms of sterility, in terms of, you know, the, the plasmids, you know, lysogeny, things like that, that weren't really present at the first, you know, couple of patients that we treated. So as there are more and more interest in this, there are more and more patients being treated, uh, there is more stringency to make, you know, for a variety of different factors. One, to make sure it's indicated, the second, to make sure that it's safe for the patient. So the number of indications may have widened, but the amount of information you need to put into each packet is quite a lot now. Got it. Well, thank you so much for answering all these questions and for sharing. And yeah, we'll make this talk available. So if people want to see it there, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll write about it in our newsletter and share it so you have it. So yeah, thanks, Saima, for thank being Thank you.